Hi, good afternoon, Mr. Go. Hi, good afternoon. We are not going to start with how's your day because it's gloomy, dark sky has been looming around and we know now for a fact that thunderstorm is uh, coming our way. We are in harm's way now, okay? So, tell me, why are you into politics? Are you in it because you want to make money out of it? I would say that I lose a lot of money instead of making money, you know, at this moment. Um, politics in PAP, maybe you can make a lot of money, but not in our position. That's the one. Why do you say that PAP make money in politics? Are you saying there's corruption, nepotism, no, no. or what, what are you trying to say? No. For example, if you are your MP, people will look for you to be a director of a public business company. Even when you step down, because of your experience and networking, people will employ you with great money. You know? So, tell me, answer my question. Why? Do you enter politics? It started off in 1997. During the election, the Prime Minister then, Go Chok Tong, actually came up with this HTV upgrading as a carrot and a stick. I feel very strongly against it. Right then, actually very, very strongly against the asset, asset enhancement program, which I am still fighting. Why I am mean so against it? It changed the dynamics of voters, of Singaporeans, the mindset. It turns people to be very materialistic instead of looking at the bigger picture. Our nation, the interest, it draws people's attention back to what's in for you. And this is not it is something um, not good for the, for the future. When you have something like that, it actually sends a very wrong signal to people who choose their votes. This is not the one, the place that I want for my, my children, my future generations. I made my promise. Either I change it by getting in or I leave the country. Look, you are born in the 70s, you are 50 today. You, you have followed a regular track from junior college to university. You got a good job. The FICs are all there waiting for you. But you know that the path for opposition party politician in Singapore is peppered with stones, spikes and everything. Do you think you have been fair to your family? Well, um, my wife always grumbled. She earns more, far more than me. Of course, we come from um, different places, but with the same educational background. In fact, uh, there's no doubt about it. I'm smarter than her. She always I admit, mean, right? but she earns more than me. But in our life, we have come to terms with that. We say that she can have a, a, a good earning, and I can do, I can chase my dreams <coughs> of change. Right, but there's always a, a bottom line, and our ultimatum is time to stop. Right? But not yet, I hope. Many people have been abusive towards you, from your Facebook to some of the statements that you make. Don't you feel demoralized and dejected at days uh, in those days where people just do not see eye to eye? On your, on your particular political pursuit? That's what plural voice is all about, right? That's what I'm actually fighting for. Democracy is not just what you or jiang, me jiang. People can say what they want, but it is my job to start from the ground of political education. Give different perspective to people to look at things differently and how things can be done differently. That's why I always start a blog called Singapore Alternatives. Alternatives, perspective, alternatives, policies. They may not agree with me. A lot of people don't agree with me, right? But one thing, one thing I have, they do not have. The courage and the guts. At your age now, with your university degree and 
following, like I said, the charted path, you have made tens of thousands a month easily, okay, by now. So, are you, what, beside this, are you giving up anything beside money, monetary wise? My privacy, of course. Being very inconvenient when I do business, even outside of Singapore, right? Even when I want, <clears throat> I want um, to do a check, account, checking account, open a bank account. It took me four months, maybe. People only took two days. You know, these are the inconvenience, but it's okay. That's the price I have paid. I have decided to pay, right? Of course, my peers, my peers who have gone through the same path as me, good JCs, good ed education, they are making more money, but I have no regrets. Now, when you are championing for the right cause that you believe in, you have given up many things. This is probably going to be the last leg of your political career. What are your plans now? Well, um, most probably I will not disappear. My aim is not just to get myself into Parliament, but at the same time, to help good people to get into Parliament. Within the opposition for so long, you know, there are people who we can trust and we cannot trust. It's a fact of life, even within PAP itself. It's an inherent fear of many Singaporeans that when too many opposition parties get into the parliament, we become a, we become a helter-skelter whereby fights, arguments and dragging of policy making and so on and so forth, just like in Hong Kong, in Taiwan and so on and so forth. This is an inherent fear among Singaporeans. How do you pacify this fear? Look at things from a different way. Could PAP make better decisions if there are no opposition at all? Look at other places where the authoritarian, without any opposition in, in their system, are they better or even worse? So opposition is part and parcel of a system to actually make things work better. We should not fear that there will be uh, things like uh, disruptions. Just vote them out if they don't, do not perform. Look. Based on your line of argument, China is a one-party country. Things appears to be going fine with not even a singular opposition voice within. So how do you explain that? If you know, really know China, the underlying current is very strong. When you continue to surprise that, the only when you make the option of changing policies or even the government is by revoke. That is more destructive. But if you have a system that allows people to actually contest of ideas, to have a say, or even vote them up to change people to be, become the leaders, it works you know, without a revolution. That is actually a more stabilized system than for authoritarian countries. $48 billion for the what, stimulus package, resilient package, whatever you may call it. Look, every government is penniless. Every government does not have a penny to their name. All the money in the national coffer comes from we taxpayers. So, just because the government of the day is the one who have the mandate to rule for five years, to govern for five years, they can use the money. What is your view about this? You have to give credit to them. They understood the crisis. It's a real crisis. They understood, just like Mr. Heng said, I have, I have said before, we have saved for so long, for the past decades, on our reserve, and this is it. This is a crisis that we need to spend, and he did spend. So there's, we can't fault him on whether to use it for electionary and all of that, because it is a crisis itself. Having said that, if it's not for opposition that presses on, would he actually realise that urgency to spend? That is why I believe credit should also be given to opposition because of the pressure that comes in. So we share the credits. You know, 
but he has the power, he has the emphasis and the bending to decide to spend. And I applaud him for that. There is this rumours, this whispering on the ground. Whenever the government of the day gives you a chicken wing, they always take back a chicken. Okay? So, how do you view this man on the street statement? I think as a government, you will have to balance your accounts. It is only responsible to do that, but not in excess. So it's a matter of degree. You do not need to take everything off or more, more than you need to. So it's a matter of balance and you need opposition to check it, to prevent them from overdoing it, like increasing of GST. Is there a need? Since we, we now know that they have a lot of money to spend, why would they want to increase GST? Now that we are dig into our reserve, do you think certain of the mega projects that were proposed or ongoing should take a back seat while we recover from this thunderstorm? I do not think so. In contrary. Right? Because this amount, 20 billion, even 30 billion that you take out from the reserve, is very small percentage of the overall reserve that we have. And if you are going to stop the spending, actually it affects the economy. So you actually negate the effort to actually keep the economy going, from going into the spiral. Look, 48 plus 4 plus, we probably have about $52 billion in total. We have 3.5 million plus minus Singaporeans around. So simple mathematics, each one will be entitled to about 14,000 equivalent. Mm -hmm. Is that how we do the calculation? No, no, no. Um, I think that that's wrong. Huh? If you look at, I just took a, take a look at the infographic this morning, right? Out of this 55 billion, so-called, almost 22 billion are used as a loan facilities for corporates. These are not actually totally spent and not getting back. It's just a temporary loaning. Right. So the actual, the actual spending is about 28 billion, right? And I have to get, get credit for that, about 15 billion dollars, I think slightly more than 15 billion dollars are given directly to people who have lost their job, who are freelancing, like taxi driver, grab driver, who are not earning enough because of the crisis, and they give the money into their pockets. I think that is very important. But it's not going to be like 10,000 or 15,000. Maybe spread through about 5,000 in average. It might be a temporary measures at the moment. I expect if the crisis carries on like that, they might have to give more on the second stu uh, stimulus package. Look, we men on the street is only interested in one thing. When are we going to get cash from the government to pay for the rental and pay for the tuition fee and pay for everything, all the necessity, all the essential necessity that we need to live by? What is your thought about this? Well, not only the, the men on the street are thinking of that. The businesses are thinking how are they going to get access to all this funding, all this help. Now, execution is very important to make it a success. In the past, they might have about $4 billion, they said, to cope with the, the crisis, anything, but at the end, they didn't spend much out of it. Why? It's the execution part. How do you execute? You must be very systematic. You don't wait for people to apply, but you just approach them to say whether you need help, and that's, we have this help. For the businesses, they are complaining that some of those small enterprises, they do not know where to apply. No? So the businesses actually need someone to hold their hands, especially the small enterprises. Set up a system within the finance ministry, a, a centralized system for people to inquire and direct them for the help. And I think this is very important. Prime Minister Lee have just said that he requires a strong mandate and a strong team. No, not he. Singapore requires a strong mandate and a strong team to take us out of this pandemic crisis. What 
do you think constitute to a strong team and what is a strong mandate? A strong team doesn't mean only PAP only. A strong team means you must have opposition who knows exactly what is going on and knows where are the blind spots and knows exactly what are the measures that is needed to counter a proposed. It's not about having all the votes, all the seats to giving, given to PAP. I, ha I, I have to stress this again. Without a good opposition, the performance was slight and become mediocre. Do you think his statement was meant to instill fear in Singaporeans? I hope not, but it seems to be that so. Right? But voters think in longer term. We have to think longer term than this. Yes, they are giving money to you, but it's not their money. It's our money as a nation. And they are able to do that because we, opposition, prices them and we did not actually say it's a bad idea. So these are the responsible boss or opposition will do. And you need these people also. So in terms of balance, we need someone to run the country as well as a critic on the sideline. Well, Mr Goh, for now is that do you even remotely consider that um, you're going to call it a day, take the back seat and let the newer generation take up the metal to become the check and balance force in the parliament? As far as I'm concerned, I can retire any time. Right? My wife will be very happy if I retire now because I've lost so much of a family time over the years, over the decades, over two decades. No? But I still think at this moment, there's something for me, in me, that I fulfill. I came out to make a promise, to make a change. And I'm still far away from that change that I'm foreseeing. So I hope this round, I really can make a change. If not, then 50 years, 50 years of life, I think I deserve to spend the next 20 years, productive years, you know, for my family and my own. Thank you, Mr. Goh. Good health. Thank you.